The old Clatsop chief arrived with some excellent salmon and the meat of a large fish. There came with him a man about thirty years of age, who has extraordinarily dark red hair, and is the supposed offspring of a ship that was wrecked within a few miles of the entrance of this river many years ago. Great quantities of beeswax continue to be dug out of the sand near this spot, and the Indians bring it to trade with us. They bring us frequently lumps of beeswax fresh out of the sand which they collect on the coast to the south, where the Spanish ship was cast away some years ago and the crew all murdered by the natives. Alexander Henry Representative of the Northwest Company in Astoria, 1813-14. Chapter 2 Strategies for Movement Nehalem Bay State Park has an airstrip and a flying camp. If you own a small passenger plane, you can land on the runway and taxi to your campsite, or very close to it. There is also a horse camp, which reminds me of the 4-H fairs I remember from childhood. The ammonia stench and soft leather of the stables, cowboy daydreams, chunks of birds, pieces of wings, feet and beaks and reins sodden piles of anonymous feathers line a little strip of gravel footpath between the bay and the edge of the runway, when gulls and other birds are chopped up by airplane propellers, campers in the campground can hear the sudden sputter of a struggling engine, suggesting an even greater tragedy might be at hand. Fortunately this rarely happens, but the suggestion of possibility is enough to unnerve. For pilots taking off southward into the prevailing wind there too is the promise of shallow water in which to crash, and a field of thin dunes to the north of the runway in case the landing runs long, that is, I can imagine worse places in which to crash. On an otherwise cloudless day, a perpetual cloud sits atop near Carne Mountain dribbling strands of fog downhill between the treetops. It evaporates into nothingness before reaching the foot of the mountain, like a gaseous backlit waterfall above a bartender's nook at a fancy nightclub. Cresting the top of the grassy dunes of Nehalem Beach never fails to give me a thrill of a sort. The tops of these simmering hills, alive and hissing with the slightest breeze, is one of those sure fireplaces, or rather, a string of them. From the isolation of the north jetty of the Nehalem River to the welcome mats and mailboxes of the beach houses at the edge of Manzanita itself, that never, ever lets me down. The land between the campground and the jetty is like a hedge maze. Deer and elk have cut new trails between the paths made by decades of horse traffic, a million hooves having trampled the paths to a slushy, deep well of sand that remains cool to bare feet a few inches below the surface because the walls of beach grass and scotch broom are too tall to allow light to filter through them. Just like a hedge maze, there are countless ways to become lost. A herd of Roosevelt elk roams the peripheries of the bay and disappears into the wilderness of the sand spit in summer, when the campground is noisy, or into the mountains. In winter they frequent the campground like the bison and moose of Yellowstone. They were once waiting at my campsite when I arrived. I had to wait for them to wander off before I could park. The bay is home to a plethora of beach logs in various states of nudity that get pulled into the bay during high tides. Many of them are the remains of clear cuts, logs rejected for one reason or another and left to tumble into the sea during the winter landslides, slides precipitated by the clear cutting itself. There are also plenty of ball-like root networks that terminate in cleanly shorn stumps, the leftovers of mass decapitations, 
There are coyotes around the bay, too. Like coyotes everywhere, they often go off all at once late at night. The yodels and howls that in many parts of the west almost make up for the lack of fireflies, the weird hollerings of the wild that create equally otherworldly sense memories. There is always a dark side. One day out of the blue I hear sudden yowling in the middle of the afternoon, a gunshot that echoes across the day, the brief, panicked yips of a baby coyote, more gunshots, and then more silence. It seems to consist largely of the third and fourth and fifth homes of the affluent who spend their winters in places far sunnier, like Mexico or Florida. The center of Manzanita on a winter's evening reminds me of my Midwestern hometown, in the aftermath of the blizzard, in the dead of the darkest night. Electric candles glimmer in the shop windows and I think of Christmases and cocoa. I stumble up the beach in a winter's mid-afternoon gale for a cup of homemade chicken noodle soup and sticky potatoes to warm my innards, and wash it down with a cold Jones blue bubblegum soda. Manzanita, where are the corner market as they are bagging my groceries they ask if I am walking, because they know I like to carry my bags home on the beach, I say I am and they automatically double back for me, still it rarely works, thanks to my barefoot in the surf perambulations, by the time I get home a hole or two has always appeared, the paper bags, the only bags otherwise strong enough to survive the journey, and later to become starter fuel for my campfires, having been victimized by splashed back. Bees wax from a long lost shipwreck continues to wash up on the beaches near Nihalem Bay. The wax originated in Southeast Asia, guessing exactly where is a local sport, and the trade galleon that brought it was wrecked probably in the late 17th or early 18th century, we'll probably never know for sure. Accounts from before the dawn of the 20th century suggest the wax had already been buried under 10 feet of sand. Observers noted then, before the modern jetty was built, that the land was growing seaward and burying the deposits of beeswax, a process that has only continued in the years since. In other words, there might still be plenty of wax preserved in the improvised solidity of the sand spit. There are also accounts of it washing up a few miles upriver of the bay, where it has been pushed by high tides. In all sobriety, it is unlikely in the extreme that I will ever find a chunk of the bee's wax, the ground having been worked over and churned by generations of the curious which only makes the prospect more enjoyable to entertain. Moreover, Manila galleons, riding low in the water on the prevailing winds and currents into the North Pacific before rolling slowly down the coast to New Spain, overburdened and falling apart, traded off this shore for a quarter of a millennium, along with innumerable smaller, more localized traders. Wrecked people and objects have been washing up here for a long, long time. D.B. Cooper's Money On November 24, 1971, a man calling himself Dan Cooper hijacked a Boeing 727 between Portland and Seattle claiming to be carrying a bomb. In Seattle he demanded $200,000 and allowed all passengers but the flight crew to disembark, and ordered the plane to be flown to Mexico. At some point, Dan Cooper, to be known by the press as D.B., after a gobbling of the facts of the case, jumped out of the low and slow flying jet with two parachutes and disappeared into the chilly northwest night. It is not a man or his motives that most interest me. A guy jumping alone out of a jet airplane is one thing, a guy jumping with $200,000 something else. 
Without his ill-gotten money, the whole legend would be little more than an absurd stunt of a hapless daredevil or a weird, especially mild act of domestic terrorism. The suitcase bulging with cash is what makes this story resonant for the public at large, to none more so than those of us who hang out here where it fell, somewhere. Not only is it inherently valuable in itself, assuming the $20 bills are still recognizable as such, but the real worth of D.B. Cooper's money has only gone up with time, appreciating and compounding interest the way only an undiscovered artifact of history can. Like a suggested possibility of encountering Bigfoot whilst stumbling about in the high forests, the possibility, if it has been not only entertained but done so with a healthy dose of skepticism, with an acknowledgement of the indisputable facts and length of the odds but without any other degree of prejudice, that one might come across a time, battered samsonite heavy with bricks of bound up cash while slogging through coastal swamps and over grassy dunes makes the stumbling and the slogging more fun. It is an imagined fantasy that can be lain over reality for a cheap thrill, like a game, just for fun. Here is a chance to define the value of fantasy for its own sake, escape. The game requires the same suspension of disbelief required by fiction combined with enough knowledge of the facts around the legend to avoid slipping off into irrational or delusional voids. This is no place either for other skeptics, who are missing a perfect opportunity for imaginative play, or fanatical believers, who often are so passionate about the legend are so committed to their favorite theories that they end up committing, a similar sin. This is instead a game for those with just enough skepticism to derive pleasure from the intellectual challenge of trying to suppress it and curiosity and perhaps even boredom, to play it with enthusiasm. The D.B. Cooper case is not the only one involving a literal treasure on the Oregon coast. Legends of artifacts left behind by earlier explorers and the lost booty of shipwrecks abound here. Buried chests on mounting tops and hidden caches in sea caves, gold, semi-precious stones, and diamonds have been found on beaches and other metals and gems in the mountains of the coast range. The wreck Manila Galleon that continues to supply chunks of beeswax comes again to mind. For years the wax was collected by local Indians, when they weren't out gathering daintily shells, or harvesting whale blubber, and sold to white traders and settlers who used it for candles and as a sealant. The abandoned Asian beeswax turned to a trade item once again at the confluence of American and Native American history, and there's this, rather than storing valuables in deposit boxes at banks, some older Japanese people wary of banks keep their valuables in locked and sealed safe boxes stashed around their houses, along with much else. Some of these that have made the trip across the ocean will begin to wash up on northwest beaches in the coming years as a result of the 2011 tsunami. People here can be forgiven for hoping, some evidently even expecting, to discover a literal fortune waiting on or in the ground. As it happens, a portion of D.B. Cooper's money has already been found. Several years after the heist, three bundles of $20 bills that matched the serial numbers of some of the stolen money were discovered buried in the sandy banks of the Columbia River. A boy camping with his family discovered them and handed them over to the FBI. After identifying them, the FBI returned some of the bills and he later sold 15 of them for $37,000. There is a tendency for things to drift downstream from Portland and then become trapped between the competing salt and freshwater currents that slosh over the river's sandy bar. 
to be deposited along the jetties and bluffs. I once discovered a tribe of Israel patch torn from a jacket. It had washed up with a carpet of plastic bottles and styrofoam on the Columbia's southern bank, that probably originated in the upriver metro sprawl, but could easily have been adrift for years only to be pushed slightly inland by a storm. I still have it, stuffed in a keychain junk drawer. I am greeted by the black, green, and yellow of the Jamaican flag embroidered on it every time I look for a toothpick or spare time, that the money was found in the Columbia, perhaps having been dumped there by one of its many feeder streams, suggests that the rest of it and perhaps the intact suitcase itself may have floated out to sea. It is possible that the money found in 1980 may have been taken out by Cooper and stashed on his person, a few bundles stuffed into a pocket as a precaution in case he lost the suitcase in their jump. If so, the suitcase and money may still be out there somewhere, on any coastline in the world, still floating or washed up on some shore, maybe a shore nearby may be buried in the shifting sands where I find myself today. The game really is one of faith. The search for, or more precisely the vague and hazy hope of stumbling across, D.B. Cooper's money requires both a recognition of the virtually impossible odds and a tiny, infinitesimal respect for the tiny, infinitesimal exception, that even if the odds were one in a hundred billion, The one can't be completely ignored, a willingness to entertain the extreme remoteness of the chance is such a small thing that it is like a key that unlocks the door, like a shibboleth, like a password, it could happen. Psychotic Breakdown I arrive at a beach campground in Washington state that I have never visited before, having scored reservations for a nine-night stay in the only site in the campground for which such a long stay was possible. I have come this far north on a whim conceived in the depths of winter and hatched in mid-spring, a sudden and uncontrollable urge to see a place I've never seen before. It is a niche I don't think I'll ever again be able to resist scratching, but this time I've rolled a dice on campsite selection, as I often must, I could end up with almost anything, what I end up with turns out to be primo, my sight is spectacular in the fuzzy and warm overcast light of mid-afternoon, not a tree or shrub stands between my sight and miles of the widest beaches on the coast which begin about 200 feet off the starboard bow of my trailer once parked. For nine days I will be living a stone's throw from the very edge itself. Most days I won't even put on sandals to go for a walk. I'll simply walk through the door and into the dunes. The campers who arrive next day in the site next to mine seem to be lovely people. They smile and nod when I see them. They are a man and woman I take to be a married couple, although they may be siblings, or unrelated altogether, I'll never figure it out for certain, though our loop of the campground is truly beautiful, the sites are rather close together and the lack of vegetation also means a lack of privacy, their motorhome parallels my trailer putting their fire pit and picnic table about 20 feet from the two large windows on that side of me. In such close quarters I can't help but witness the preparations for a picnic. Cloth table cloth on the table, red champagne flutes of real glass, a few batches of store-bought flowers and a platter of cheeses. When they are done they fidget and wait, for what I don't yet know but they keep glancing toward the park entrance, but again they smile and wave as I pass them during my barefooted trek through the shallow grassy dunes to the beach. The shockingly flat, 
Vacant expanse of beach serves only to amplify the natural contrast typical of most Pacific beaches between vast swaths of visual space that appear at such distances to be utterly static and the relatively tiny pockets of space inhabited by humanity, identifiable chiefly by motion and color. A set of wind turbines were atop a nearby hill, resembling an oddly discontiguous, industrialized version of Christ's crucifixion on Golgotha as depicted by medieval illuminists. For horsemen, on closer inspection they turn out to be horsewomen, ride hard along the high tide line, past me in a blur and down the shore, out of sight and an orgiastic flicker of color three or four miles up the beach, resolved through a telephoto lens, is not a mirage of religious ecstasy but the wildfire-like tails of box kites fluttering in straight, lion winds more persistent than any I've seen, wind so steady it can almost be ignored, the largest kites must be at least 100 feet long. I make a mental note to try my own, an entry level 2 lion stunt kite, before I leave the area. The atmosphere when I return to my trailer is weirdly tense. My neighbor's guest has arrived. He squints and stares at the side of my trailer with disgust and resentment, a hard scowl of contempt. The other two campers chat somewhat nervously about it with him, shrugging often. He looks like he is accepting an apology, smiling amicably enough in return, but the smile repeatedly fades when he glances at the side of my trailer, regarding it as a teenager regards and use it. I can't know for sure why he doesn't like me, as an utter stranger I'm clueless as to what I might have done. It could be that it isn't me, necessarily, but my trailer, not only is it squarely in the way between him and the ocean, but after another long, hard, wet winter it is only just now beginning to dry out completely, masses of half-routed leaves and twigs and crushed pine cones have concreted into dark patches on my roof and bits of weather stripping shorn free by raging winter winds have yet to be glued back into place. My trailer doesn't exactly resemble the Taj Mahal, it is true, but neither is it a total sky, I've seen far worse, at least, it could be that he is not annoyed at me per se but was expecting someone else to be here, I had, after all, obtained a sight by way of someone else's cancellation, it could be that his other friends ditched him, but something about his scowl feels personal to me, he looks not at the wall of my trailer or even really at the trailer itself, he seems to be trying to see through the windows, glareless on this overcast day, at whomever may have dared to obstruct what he must have assumed would be a completely open view more like my sight, he is impeccably dressed, and expensively, his snow white hair is professionally manicured, more than anything he moves with the confidence, the arrogance, of the extremely rich, I think what annoys him is what he must feel is a basic unfairness, I am alone and, judging by the state of the exterior of my trailer, somewhat humble, while he, if not necessarily his friends, is deserving of only the best. He would like to switch places with me camp sidewise, and only so. These are not things I intend to see. I am not spying, but in the stillness of the campground at such close quarters, the goings on in the immediate vicinity of my trailer are impromptu, randomized, and unavoidable. Like activity on a city street, the comings and goings of campers in groups or alone, outdoor activities like campfires and ball games and the chatter of conversation, all happen so constantly that it becomes background noise, virtually unnoticed except in situations like these. I've been picked at random, or perhaps this man is simply annoyed at everything. 
It is impossible to know. The etiquette of living in public demands consideration for other people's privacy, although having traveled for over two years now, I hardly expect much for myself anymore. The whole experience of travel has eroded my self-consciousness to such an extent that sometimes I barely notice that I am in public at all, like an insecure understudy. I find myself on stage whether I really want to be or not, but I politely try to ignore my neighbors and their picnic of champagne and fine cheese, I soon do, I'm on my hands and knees, deep in the neglected mass of hastily stowed miscellany in the bedroom closet, digging through the trash in the back, searching for my kite. The atmosphere back at my trailer has only grown worse in my absence. When the man first arrived at my neighbor's site and they toasted him with wine and cheese, there was something in the couple's manner that gave the impression of some sort of business meeting, as if they were two small business owners making a pitch to an important potential investor. There is an odd obsequiousness in their body language frozen smiles and eager attention to detail, traces of ceremony in their expressions, but the man now sits alone in the dunes between my trailer and the edge of the beach in a lawn chair, while the other two campers, now joined by three others dressed in semi-casual beach clothes, mill about somewhat nervously at their picnic table attempting to keep the cloth from fluttering away in the kite weather wind, stealing glances at the man in the dunes, who now seems very much alone, in the investor scenario he would be mulling a decision about startup capital costs or some such thing while the others agonize over the outcome, but when I nod to the man as I pass him on my way home and receive another hard scowl in return, I become convinced that I'm nowhere near the truth, that isn't what's going on here, the man grips the hard plastic armrests of the chair as if afraid he will fall out, he sits upright but his sandaled feet press hard at the sand anyway, as if he's afraid he might be forced to stand at any time, his neck and face muscles actually twitch, in a way I've read about but have rarely actually seen, but I realize on second thought that I have, some faces actually do that, his nerves are straining against their own effort, straining against any effort he makes, this guy is about to snap, I steer clear, and plod back to my trailer in silence, avoiding eye contact this time. Avoiding all contact forever would be fine with me and him both. There is a magic in the constant rolling and tumbling of the ocean waves that seem to wash my mind clean as efficiently as they work on the rocks and drift logs. There is something in the relative blankness of the landscape that is akin in many ways to closing one's eyes. It is simply easier to concentrate and follow a thought from inception to conclusion without pause. I have never left the beach with more stress pressing on my shoulders than I brought with me, and frequently with so much less that it feels like none. There is a meditative magic here akin to that of slow breathing. I have seen it work on others pent-up people who stumble bleary-eyed and red-faced from vehicles parked along waysides on Highway 101, returning much later laughing and smiling, or at the very least, no longer fuming, it is also a self-reinforcing magic, like that to be found while queuing for a movie and catching glimpses of happy patrons exiting the same theater you are about to enter. A magic that feeds itself. Revising my scenario, I now believe the man in the lawn chair to be a family patriarch and theoretical benefactor, a man of tremendous wealth and power in his own world, and the others have brought him here because the stress has pushed him to a breaking point. We have to get dad to a place he can relax right now, 
So they've brought him to the beach on a Friday afternoon? Perhaps he couldn't have been dragged away from his office any other day, wined and dined him to the best of their ability, and stuck him in a chair in the dunes to stare at the sea in silence. As long as I am speculating wildly, I imagine he had loved the beach as a boy. He liked to spend time on his yachts at a point much earlier in his adult life but the closest he gets to the ocean these days is a picture of a boat at sea that he keeps over his impossibly heavy wooden desk, which is what gave them the idea in the first place. This is not a bad plan, and it might even work, but I think they've waited too long, all he can see is dune and ocean and sky. Aside from my trailer, there is nowhere for him to focus his nervous energy. He is like a museum goer studying an oil painting by a great master from a hushed distance. He gets an impression of peace and beauty, but he misses the little flaws and accidents of the brush strokes, the way light plays on the surface of the dry oil and canvas. The thing to do is not to sit and try as hard as possible, to relax, but to take off shoes, roll up pant legs, and try to climb into the painting. The thing to do is to throw all reserve to the preternaturally steady winds, to wander onto the blank horizon and follow it until it ends, to revel in the utter pointlessness of it all, hell, even to frolic in it. The man is not merely sitting in the sand but stuck in it, he has allowed himself to develop such a personality, one of austerity, severity, and stoicism to the point of harshness, that frolicking is out of the question, most especially under the attentive gaze of all, in public, it's a personality that clashes with the magic the place is meant to work upon it. Maybe he would be happier on a beach in the bustle of high tourist season, maybe air fed with the din of children engaged in reckless fun, the smell of smouldering cedar and barbecue, and the kites and bicycles and the electric buzz of summer might have rejuvenated him, but I doubt it, I've seen that look of extreme overwork before, that volatile expression from sunken eyes, on a beach especially one in the carnival depths of summer, there is still too much for a person standing at the precipice of a personal abyss to complain about, there's still too much going on, if I weren't myself engaged in a game of reckless speculation, and if it were any of my business, I might suggest a padded room and some heavy medication, for all I know, that will be the next step. Darkness falls, and I no longer pay attention, I don't notice when they roll out of their sight before dawn the next morning either, this is a recurring problem with my lifestyle, there is seldom any real sort of closure, nor is there ever a chance to get to know any of my fellow campers beyond the basics even when there is an opportunity for conversation which was out of the question with these neighbors the moment their guests saw my trailer, given the touchiness of the situation as I invented it in my head, I thought it best to stay out of the way as much as possible, the experience nags, though, it nags not because my guess about what was going on will forever remain only that, and I will never have the facts, it is because I thought I recognized the look in the man's face. I have seen it not only in the mirror, more specifically, shortly before I made my decision to travel, but everywhere I have been, behind me in supermarket checkout lines, idling at gas stations, dumping trash along forest roads, throwing rocks at seagulls, picking children up after school annoying and apparently total dissatisfaction with the imbalance between joyless work and unexpectedly empty leisure, between the evident promise of physical wealth and its inability to deliver genuine happiness, 
In the back of my mind I still harbor a fear that the situation next door really did involve small business owners making a pitch to a major investor after all. I would feel lousy for the business owners if my unwashed trailer cost them the opportunity of a lifetime. Nonetheless, the specter of a man too worried about relaxing to relax will follow me as I turn my trailer around to go south again. He will pop up with all the persistent surprise of a sneaker wave, again and again stalking me and adopting superficial disguises that fail to conceal the reasons for his bitterness even as his failure to act makes him ever more embittered the meager efforts and pathetic failures of the unhappy rich. Moss on a Rolling Stone An old woman, a local, passes me on the beach. We swap pleasantries about the day. This is the last we'll see of the sun for about three months, she says, and we both chuckle. But it is a laugh of apprehension and we both know it. People here joke about rain the way Midwesterners joke about snow. But as in the Midwest the jokes run out around the beginning of February. Somehow they don't seem as funny when they are happening. Happening much too much and too often. And won't stop happening. It becomes possible. Perhaps even likely. That the rain will never stop. Waterfalls erupt from cliff faces and gush from deep forest pocket streams that run only during these extreme events, but do so every winter. New streams pour from beneath logs. So saturated is the ground that water simply begins to flow in a place that was previously dry. Temporary springs that spout anew annually. Enough rain can rearrange the topography itself and these bitches average over 70 inches a year. Outside my trailer, newborn legs emerge. When the rain finally stops, if it stops, I will have to drop wooden blocks and other spare items from my trailer basement to make a path of makeshift stepping stones or I'll have to simply wade out through the muck barefoot. I'm rained in. To a noticeable degree, One's experience of the weather here depends on where one is standing. The coast range squeezes water from clouds the way a spatula pressed against a sizzling hamburger on a grill squeezes out the fat. After crossing the flat expanse of the Pacific and encountering the mountains, moisture-laden clouds try to force an amount of water vapor through a space in the atmosphere too small for it. Creating rain, the windward side of individual slopes tend to get the wettest, in some places and in some seasons and for all intents and purposes, it practically never does stop. While clouds passing to the leeward side, freshly wrung of water, tend to slip by relatively quietly, after one more vigorous squeezing by the cascade range and evaporate in the high deserts to the east. As a result, microclimates are quite common. Ancient rain forests are but meandering dunes. Species change and flowers ignite at different times on different sides of a single hill. A well-planned hike can reward the hiker with wildly different scenarios at beginning, middle, and end. Three hikes bought with the muscle cost of one. Starting around Halloween, low pressure systems begin to stall over the northwest coast, establishing atmospheric rivers that terminate directly over my trailer. The systems draw deep subtropical moisture to cover the entire region, like a straw at the bottom of a cold wet beverage, Oregon drinks a wise milkshake, or like a rusted over faucet stuck on its widest aperture. During one such marathon on the central coast I bundle up in my rain gear and roam a beach, having grown disgusted by the sight of condensation on my trailer windows, 
and I would later discover mold growing on the otherwise pristine glass. I stumble along rocky dunes at low tide in howling winds and horizontal rain until I descend to a small stream swollen to overflowing. Over the years the stream in such states has wound a path through hard, packed sandstone such that the resulting cliffs block nearly all of the wind and rain. In the near inaccessible cavities thus created, dozens of gulls and a few crows honker with beaks folded under wings and pressed to warm downy breasts. I have discovered the empire of the birds, the place they go during storms. It is a mystery I have always pondered and I've solved it by accidental necessity. I crouch low and bury my own runny nose in wind blasted face into the collar of my coat and pull it more closely about me, to ride out the worst of the squall with the birds who know best where to be at a time like this. When at last the rain begins to slacken in spring, as it always does, but only in its own time, it does it so from south to north, traveling in synchronicity with the lengthening days, fate and coincidence put me and my trailer in the parade three years in a row, I get to travel with the sun as it unrolls itself up the coast all three times, like a procession of tidings of good things to come, new life bursts from every dead log and stump, piles of manure or old bones, every branch and twig, and everything growing on everything else. Dormant spores awaken after the rains pass, fungal sprouts blossom and propel weird tendrils from forest floors, the latest generation of that non-animal, non-plant kingdom of life, like alien species made of chitin, the same hard material that encases insect guts and those of sea creatures within their shells. The southwest facing edge of an exposed beach picnic table has been gnawed by the winter. Big chunks of wood chewed off by an insatiable monster made of wind and water. Luminescent moss and pale lime green lichens bend sunward from the teeth marks. The whole scene is dwarfed during my second spring riding north with the sun by a sign hidden in all the new life. It is an annoying reminder of a nomadic lifestyle showing symbolic signs of decay. In a semi-forgotten campground in western Louisiana I had put a half-foot scar in the hard surface of the shell of my trailer when I backed it into a tree, and I have left it exposed open to the element but seemingly inconsequential, in the pervasive damp of recent months, however, a small patch of literal moss has taken hold, producing perhaps a tiny amount of extra wind shear that slows me ever so imperceptibly as I continue rolling my figurative stone a little further on down the road. The dog and the sea creature. A windsurfer in a wetsuit carves graceful arcs in the deep water just off the edge of the low tide line, where rounded waves roll in slowly and spin themselves but do not carry far. The water goes from deep to shallow quickly but there is nothing but wet, soft sand in which to crash and I watched him with a group of tourists from Idaho with whom I've been chatting. The condition of the tide puts the windsurfer only about 50 feet away from us as he tacks with and against the western wind, manipulating his sail to keep his surfboard steady in the breakers, dodging or leaping over the largest. He seems awfully close to dry land to me. Soon a gust knocks him off balance and he turns the wrong way, and the rudder fin on the bottom of his board gouging into deep sand, destabilizing him still further, he twists into a final spin and collapses at water's edge in a tangled mass of bicarbonate tubing and nylon, an undignified end to a picturesque ride, in need of no prompting, 
The Idahoans dog rushes at the discombobulated creature in its attempt to emerge from the sea, perhaps instinctively scenting a moment of weakness in the thing's awkward labor. A frenzy of yowling barks and chomping teeth descends on the hapless creature, becoming all claws and lolling tongue and wagging tail as it snarls false defiance. The dog's name Buster is stitched into a sweater that has been wrapped around its torso to keep out the autumn chill. Buster's attack is more vocal than actual, as if by virtue of the volume of the racket he is making, he can scare the creature back to the sea, back from whence it came. It is the kind of bluff any dog lover can see through in an instant. From the creature's perspective, he has just beached his wind sail and has become caught in its rigging, is struggling to free himself while breakers continue to pummel him with merciless disregard, and he is now confronted with a mock land battle begun by sneak attack but ultimately full of sound and fury, signifying only slightly more than nothing. The Idahoans go to collect their dog and apologize, I continue down the beach.